right, we're in Mark chapter 12 today. The uh, message is Wisdom from Yeshua the Wandering Rabbi. So we just dedicated uh, Baby Serenity to a Christian life. Her parents dedicated themselves to raising her to the best of their ability in a manner that would cause her to grow up loving Jesus. And as I was touching on in the uh, baby dedication, that means something very specific. To be a Christian is, uh, does not mean that you were just born in the United States of America. To be a Christian doesn't mean that you go to church, and you've heard the line before, any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Uh, but you're not a Christian. We're not Christians because mom and dad loved Jesus. None of these, the, all of these things are good, going to church, reading our Bible, uh, Christian family, those are wonderful, but that doesn't make us followers of Jesus Christ in and of ourselves. To be a Christian means that we're, we want to be close to Jesus. We're not trying to keep him far from our lives. We're not making excuses to keep God's attention off of us. We're not finding ways to, to somehow secure a blessing while avoiding uh, the God's uh, influence in our lives. We want to be followers of Jesus. And we often say, as Jesus the wandering rabbi, we want to follow so closely that the dust he kicks up as he walks, we're covered in the dust of our rabbi. Being a Christian does not mean that we do everything right. Uh, there's only been one perfect person who's ever walked this planet, and that was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross because we don't do things right. Uh, grace is for people like us that need it. Grace is not for perfect people. Grace is for people who need grace. So in your heart, ask yourself, do I, do I need forgiveness? Do I need uh, God's grace? The Bible says that times of refreshing come with repentance. Who doesn't need to be refreshed? Say, Lord, I need to be refreshed, and I'm going to repent. My attitude has been wrong. Lord, I've been holding on to this grudge for I don't know how long. Lord, it's wrong. For, uh, Lord, the way I allow myself to speak to my coworkers or, or, or my employees or, or my boss, the, the way the feud I've been carrying on with my neighbor, Lord, the, this anger inside of me towards my husband or, or my children or my wife, Lord, uh, I repent. I'm not going to fight with you anymore. Why would I do that? You're right and I'm wrong. That's because you're God. I just want to come clean, Father, and confess, Lord, your ways are better than my ways. You're beautiful in everything you do. I'm not so much. I can be pretty nasty. I can be pretty mean and, and ornery at times. Lord, please forgive me. And the Bible says times are refreshing. When we stop struggling with God, times are refreshing, come into our life, and that's what grace is for. Again, it's not for perfect people. It's for people like you and I that, that need it. We agree that, that God does things better than we do. And we say, I want to obey Jesus as my king. I really believe that he should call the shots in my life. I can see that the choices I've made have driven me far from God. I can see that the choices I've made have brought misery in my life, tears and hardship that didn't have to be there. Lord, I want to come home. I want to come back to you. That's called faith. We're saved by grace through faith, not works. None of us could ever be good enough to go to heaven. Amen? None of us. Uh, nothing we could do. Uh, People sometimes say, well, if I polish myself up, if I get my life put together, then I'll become a Christian. Well, you'll be waiting forever because none of us are good enough. Again, if we could be good enough on our own, think about this logically. If we could be good enough on our own, look at that. Would Jesus have died for us and taken responsibility for our sin? Would he have taken our punishment if we could be good enough? No, he did that because we need to be saved. We're like people drowning in the water. We need somebody to come along and save us. We're drowning in our sins. Some people think that because it's grace, that means you can say a little prayer. Uh, come, Lord Jesus, 
be our guest and let this food be blessed or something like that. And that makes us a Christian. Uh, like you could check boxes. Like, like being a Christian is, is like uh, baking cookies, okay? I'm going to put in some butter, put in some flour, you know, little brown sugar or whatever, and I'm going to stir it up. I don't know how to make cookies. It's, yeah. Uh, and so you can just check a box, check a box. I, I believe that Jesus is God, check. I believe that Jesus died on the cross uh, because I'm a sinner, check. Uh, I believe the Bible is probably telling the truth or something, check. Uh, and now that I've marked the test correctly, I'm just going to ignore him for the rest of my life. I, I can just go and, uh, and just run in the opposite direction of God. I know he has a plan for my life. I'm going to ignore that plan. Uh, do you think that would work with a fiancé? Okay, she's a girl. I'm a boy. Check. I gave her a ring. Check. Uh, we could get married. And now, thank goodness, I've checked all the right boxes. I don't have to pay attention to that girl anymore. I, is that going to work? Is she going to say, oh, he loves me so much? God is not stupid. God knows if we're just checking boxes. Becoming a Christian, listen, is more like falling in love than baking cookies. So in your heart, have you seen the goodness of God? Have you ever thought about the cross and what Jesus done for, did for you and thought, oh, thank you. I, I want to get to know this Jesus. I want to get close to this Jesus. He seems good. Becoming a Christian is like that wanting to know Jesus, wanting to be with Jesus, wanting to be close to Jesus. If we think we're just going to check boxes and then just ignore God and get, get some sort of heaven insurance, I think God is ridiculous. I think it's stupid. I, I think, all, I think uh, Christians are a bunch of idiots, but I kind of would rather go to heaven, so check, 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 check. How is that faith? Faith means I believe God, what he says about himself, that he's good, that he will forgive, that he's perfect, that he loves me. Well, that takes a lot of faith sometimes, doesn't it? God loves you. Faith is believing it. And then faith is also believing what he says about me. Yeah, I'm made in the image of God. We're all made in the image of God. We see that right in Genesis. We also see right in Genesis that human beings, we've messed up. It, the Bible says we've fallen we're not where we should be. We've messed up, and we're not who we are today. So faith means believing God is good and understanding, yeah, I'm not all I should be. I don't measure up to my parents' expectations. I don't measure up to God's expectations for sure. And deep down inside, I don't even measure up to my own expectations. I, I, faith is believing that. God says, you're a sinner. You're messed up. And everybody, without, without the cross, without faith in Christ, all of us would be eternally separated from perfect God. We need this forgiveness. So faith is saying, God, I believe you're good, and I'm messed up. God, please forgive me. I want to I wanna come into your family, and I, <laughs> I'm tired of fighting with you. I'm tired of, tired of keeping you away. And Lord, I just want to... I just want to come home and be with you. I want to live my life with you. Not, not some religious game. I don't want to pretend to be a Christian. I want to be a follower. I want to be one of your people. Lord, please uh, let me in. And God always, always, always says, the Bible says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. saved. He doesn't say, oh, I'll take about half. He doesn't say, well, I'll take the top 10%. If you call out to God say, Lord, forgive me, here I am. You know me. I've messed up in so many ways, but I want to be what you're part of. Please let me in your family. God always says yes, and he will answer your prayer, and he will wrap his arms around you. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been, and he will bring you into his family, and you will be part of the family of God for eternity, and that's faith. Don't make faith in your mind some magic word like bibbidi-bobbidi-boo or hocus pocus. Faith is not a magic word. Faith, let's, let's change it a little bit. Faith sounds so spiritual, right? Trust. Do you trust God with your life? Because if you say, I'm going to check some boxes, but now I'm going to do whatever I want, that's not trust, is it? 
I want to do things God's way. I fall short. I mess up. I screw up. But I see God's ways. They're better than Dan Wolf's ways. You, you can put your own name in there. You don't have to put my name in there. Yeah. In your heart, say, God's ways are better than Adam's ways. God's ways are better than Buck's ways. God's ways are better than Sheila's ways. You know, in, in our hearts, admit and confess, yeah, God, you're a lot more wonderful than I am. So don't make it, faith is sometimes so and so spiritual. Just think about your, in your heart, trust. What does it mean for me to trust Jesus? God says, come here, and I, and I go. God says, I have a new life for you. And I say, well, I wasn't doing so great on my own. God says, trust me. And you say, yeah, I think I can do that. Nobody else died for me on the cross. And if we say, no, I don't trust you to call the shots of my life again, but I'm going to sign up for that free heaven insurance and then ignore you, he's not going to feel like, he's not going to feel the love. It's not love. And he knows the difference between real faith in uh, plain marbles with diamonds, right? God can tell the difference. When we truly love Jesus, uh, he becomes our everything. Not right away sometimes, but more and more, we're, we're, we're putting our lives are going to orbit the sun, S-U-N, right? Uh, no, 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 S-O-N. That was so clever when I thought of it. <laughs> our lives are going to orbit the S-O-N sun, just like the earth orbits the moon, my life is going to orbit Jesus Christ. The orient, uh, you, I said the moon. You know what? It was good before. It's, uh, yeah. No, there will be more. Jesus, Jesus is our everything. He's our savior. Think about what that means. It means I needed to be saved. I'm not I don't come to heaven riding on a high horse. I come on my knees saying, Lord, forgive. Jesus is our master. He's our benefactor. He's our rescuer. He's a friend. The Bible, people call him a friend of sinners. I'll take that. I qualify. He's our mediator between God the Father and ourselves. He's our, the Bible calls him our elder brother. He was the firstborn. Uh, he's our hope. And I don't see any hope in the world I don't see any hope on the news. I don't see any hope in here. Jesus is our hope. He's our rock. He's our refuge, our strength, our redeemer, our righteousness, our protector, our advocate. He's our foundation. That's where we get the name of our church from. Again, today's sermon is wisdom from Yeshua, Jesus, the wandering rabbi, because we want to follow that teacher. It's a bit of a reprieve. Today's message uh, from the kind of the dramatic things we've seen in Mark the last couple weeks, this relentless march to the cross. Jesus is going to the cross. A lot is happening suddenly. And today it's going to be like a pause button. And Jesus is, before he's going to the cross, he says, I have some more things I want to teach you. So he's going to teach us a couple of uh, things about who he is and about how we should live and respond to him. The entire chapter is made up of seven distinct teachings that Christ gives and he gives these in a response to the challenges of the religious elite of his day. Being religious didn't make you a friend of Jesus. Jesus went right after the religious people of his day. He said, you guys are like a, a brood of vipers. You guys are nasty. Being religious didn't make them on God's side, did it? People say, well, as, as long as you're sincere. God never said that about religion. You can be very religious and very, very far away from God. Sincerity, uh, you can be a sincerely nasty person. You can be sincerely angry with God. That doesn't uh, put us in a good relationship with God. In other words, these are the things that Jesus wanted to teach you and I. The things we're going to study today, right before the cross, these are things he wanted us to know. Seven teachings that all Christians should embrace. So if you are a, a Christian, this is something you should embrace. If you're not a Christian yet, again, there's really no reason not to get it done. God's waiting, and like a loving Heavenly Father, he's been patient. He'll, he'll draw you right in as soon as he comes. So Mark chapter 12, and I'm going to read the first 12 verses here. This is the first of the seven teachings. 
Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard, but they seized him, beat him, and sent him out empty-handed. So riding around, we know these are ordinary people. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck the man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat and others they killed. By the way, Jesus is talking about Israel. It was a vineyard. And God kept sending them prophets. He kept sending them people to teach them about him. And the people said, I don't want to listen to this. Some of them they just ignored. Some of them they beat up. And some of the people who came to them to tell them about Jesus, they actually killed <clears throat> uh, from verse 6 he had one left to send a son whom he loved and he sent him last of all saying surely they will respect my son uh, S-O-N but the, but the tenants said to one another this is the heir come let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours and if you're thinking well that doesn't make sense that's the point when we're living in sin and rebelling against God it doesn't make sense they think they're going to kill the son and get all the blessings how does that work? It doesn't work. Uh, so they took him, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And a lot of people this, think this is when Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D., Christ is prophesying. Uh, haven't you read the passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus is talking about himself. The stone the builders rejected is now the cornerstone of something new that God is making. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our sights. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because he knew, they knew he was speaking the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they let him be, and they went away. Jesus uh, is expanding on the truth revealed through the, the fig tree object lesson, remember? Uh, Jesus went to, to the fig tree and there was no fruit there so he said curse you curse you fig tree may you never have figs again and and they came by the next day and the fig tree was withered up and a lot of people read that and think well jesus doesn't like plants that but jesus was talking about the temple the old testament system of worship and they had they had no longer bearing fruit they were no longer a place where you could go to be blessed and jesus was coming he was going to bring something new and he was saying the temple system is no longer going to bear fruit uh, that just like this fig tree no longer bore fruit and now he's talking about this vineyard you should have gotten you should have gotten the wine from the vineyard instead they beat the sons they they killed the son they beat some of the people he sent before and jesus is saying that's going to be put to an end this is no longer going to be the way that people will come uh, to know god instead i'm going to be the cornerstone of something brand new and a cornerstone would be that first big stone that a builder would use and from there he'd start building the rest of the house so the cornerstone is jesus christ and from there the rest of the church has been built all over the world he's also letting people know who he is who he is he's saying before i go to the cross i want you to let you know i'm going to be the cornerstone of what god is doing something entirely new brand new and he's saying the philistines uh, pharisees will kill him before they actually do it did you read that did you notice that before he was put to the cross jesus is saying i'm the son that's going to be killed this is prophecy jesus is saying this is what's going to happen to me uh so the pharisees were not the ones in control of jesus destiny he was choosing the time and place for his death so if you're a christian your life is founded on this cornerstone He's the corner of your life. Uh, you build everything else on it. All the rest of our life is built on Jesus Christ. He is our foundation. Uh, even if, like the Pharisees, if other people reject him and hate him, it doesn't matter. You still build your life on Jesus Christ, and it doesn't matter what the culture thinks. The culture has a lot of opinions. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we build our lives on the solid rock. Uh, culture, what's fashionable, that changes all the time. Public opinion changes all the time. What one generation thinks is right and wrong, the next generation is different. They rebel against their parents' generation. 
The word of God endures forever. We don't need to change because somebody doesn't like what we believe. Jesus Christ is our basis, and we're going to build our lives on him. Amen? Uh, second, uh, second teaching that Jesus has for us is from uh, verse 13, uh, 13 through 17. Uh, here, if you don't like to pay your taxes, let me just say real quick, Jesus says, pay your taxes. Uh, from verse, uh, but he didn't say you had to like it. But, uh, from verse 13, later on, uh, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Pharisees and the Herodians, by the way, didn't like each other. The Herodians really didn't care about religion except for using it for political purposes. The Herodians were close to Rome. The Pharisees didn't like Rome. These two groups did not like each other. But they were now friends because they both didn't like Jesus because they liked the status quo. Society was just fine. Jesus Christ was stirring things up too much. Jesus Christ did, never said to his followers, don't rock the boat. He basically said, go out and sink the boat. We've got a brand new way of doing things where there's going to be a total change in the culture. And the Herodians and the Pharisees, the Herodians were like the elite, the rich uh, they were like the Hollywood people of their era. They were the, the socialites. They had all the connections. And the Pharisees were the religious people. They understood the Old Testament very well. They, they were, really tried to live very strict lives to follow God, but they were also, just because they're religious didn't mean they're connecting with God. They were also missing. And you know they were missing how? Because they wanted to kill God incarnate. When you want to kill God incarnate, that's a good clue that you're off base. Uh, so from verse 13, later they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. And again, that's just sneaky. And it's not very spiritual. It's not very holy if I'm just going to try to catch somebody and nail somebody. They came to him and said, they, did, they didn't say, they came to him to find out the truth. Maybe they were really searching for God and they didn't know. But that's not what they did. They are playing games instead of looking for truth. They came to him and said, teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. A bunch of liars. No wonder he called them snakes, right? They didn't respect Jesus. I've had people do that to me. Pastor. I said, I ain't your pastor. Because they're just calling me a pastor, trying to butter me up, build me up, and, and uh, they don't believe a word I'm saying anyway, so in what sense am I their pastor? So he says, uh, teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity, and you aren't swayed by others. Because you pay no attention to who they are. See, they're trying to set a trap for them. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So, so is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? And here's what they're doing. The Jewish people were very patriotic. They hated their Roman overlords. Rome was ruling their country. If Jesus said, oh yeah, pay the taxes, he'd look like a sellout to all the people. And by the way, even though Jesus gives a good answer here, he starts the beginning of his ministry in Jerusalem here when he came in, we call it the triumphal entry. He's very popular. Because he spoke truth, Jesus becomes less and less popular as the days go by until the crowds are shouting, crucify, crucify. Isn't that interesting? You'd think that if Jesus came to Janesville, he'd be popular. Well, Sometimes we don't want to see God. That's why we kind of avoid the Bible and church and everything. Because we, when we see God face up, we've got to say, wow, his ways are better than my ways. And we don't like to say that. I don't like to say that. It reminds us how much we need grace. Grace is a good thing, but it's hard to say you need it, isn't it? So uh, they set this trap for Jesus. But the Bible says Jesus knew their hypocrisy. God can see our hypocrisy. We're not going to pray a beautiful prayer and trick God into thinking into, we're so religious, we love him so much. Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked them. Bring me a denarius, a little coin. Let me look at it. They brought him a coin. He asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? They said, Caesar's, they replied. And Jesus said, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God's what was God's. And they were amazed at him, basically saying, pay your taxes, pay your tithe. And uh, he totally avoided the trap that they had for him. I've had Christians come up to me and say, well, I don't think we should pay taxes because I don't like what the government does with this money or whatnot. Listen, the Roman Empire 
much more diabolic and barbaric than anything we've ever had in the United States. They used their, money, they used their taxes so the rich could throw orgies and have huge parties where they actually burnt Christians at the stake in these things. And Jesus said, pay your taxes. It's you have responsibility to be God-honoring. Now, in the United States, we live in a democracy. We can vote. We can affect government, and we should. We should uh, more Christians should be involved in the political process. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you like what's going on or not. You have responsibility as a Christian to uh, uh, be obedient, to honor your government. When do we disobey the government? When they tell us you can't talk about Jesus, you can't pray, uh, you, <laughs> you can't gather together in, in groups like this. When the government tells us we cannot obey God, then we choose God over the government. But in all this stuff like speeding limits or whatnot, all that stuff that, that's not a moral issue, we just got to obey what God says. That's, we got to obey what the government says. Uh, because God is the one who instituted government. Uh, otherwise, there's chaos, and chaos is always worse even than uh, the Roman Empire. J. Werner McGee, famous Bible scholar, said, I must confess that then I, res I must confess that I resent paying tax income tax. But that, is not, that does not mean I ought not to pay. We have a definite responsibility to government. Also, we have a responsibility to our loved ones. We have a responsibility to our church. I have a responsibility to you today to give the word of God to you. We all have our responsibilities, and that, what, yeah, that is what the Lord is saying. You have a responsibility to Caesar. Discharge it. But that doesn't relieve you of your responsibility to God. My, what a marvelous incident. Actually, he takes this incident and turns it into a par parable. I'm still quoting J. Vernon McGee. Give me a coin. With that coin, he illustrated a great truth. The coin has two sides. There are two areas of life in which we have responsibility. Man has both earthly or physical and a heavenly or spiritual obligation. Citizens of heaven pay taxes down here. And pilgrims down here should deposit eternal wealth in heaven uh, by the way we live our lives, earning rewards in heaven. Okay, third of the seven teachings that Jesus has. Uh, Chapter 12 from verse 18. Then the Sadducees. Now, so we've had the Herodians come, and they were they really not that in, interested in religion. They're interested in, in socializing. They're interested in political power. They're close to Rome. They've tied their, the, you know, they've, they've tied their wagon to the, the Herod royal family. And then we had the Pharisees, who were very legalistic, very strict, uh, very interested in the things of God, but no heart for God. Now we have the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection or angels or most of the Old Testament. And so we always say that's why they were sad, you see. Uh, so the Sadducees, if the, if the Pharisees were like the religious conservatives of their day and Jesus took them on, these are like the religious liberals of their day. And it's interesting to me that both groups had a problem with Jesus. Both groups had a problem with Jesus. The conservatives didn't like Jesus, the real Jesus. And the liberals didn't like Jesus, the real Jesus. And both of them came at Jesus, and Jesus put them both in their place. Uh, there was no resurrection, they said, when they came to him. Teacher, they, uh, I'm sorry. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that a, if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up the offspring. Isn't this a great question they've got? I'm already tired. Now, there were seven brothers. And they, you could just see their smugness on their face. They think they're so clever. Now there's seven brothers. The first married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no children. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And you can see them all kind of doing something with their beards and leaning back. They're so clever. God is not impressed, by the way. Uh, since all seven were married to her, Jesus replied, are you not in error because you don't know the Bible? <laughs> you don't know the scriptures or the power of God? So they come to him. They think they've got such clever questions. Jesus says, man, you guys are missing it. And it's because you guys don't know your Bible, do you? And, and you don't really know the power of God. You're just playing games with religion. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising. Have you not read in the book of Moses, he's talking about the first five books of the Bible, 
in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead. He's, he didn't say, I was Abraham's God. I was the God, uh, Isaac's God. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are badly mistaken. Jesus wasn't there to make things soft and gentle. These folks were out of line, and he called it. He's a, Jesus is a straight shooter, and he said it as it is. Sadducees, theologically incorrect. They devalued scripture. They didn't think it was important. As a result, they knew nothing about God. Jesus didn't pamper them. Again, straight shooter. Because, why? Because he didn't like them? No, because he loved them. Jesus died for Sadducees. Jesus died for Pharisees. Jesus died for Herodians. He loves everybody. And the reason he spoke hard words is so they could be shaken and realize, wait, I'm wrong. I need to be forgiven. I need a Savior. Jesus is calling everybody, everyone who is weary and heavy laden. Jesus says, if you're feeling this burden on your back, life is too much, your own sin is getting you down, life is hard, he says, come to me and I will give you rest. This included the Sadducees, everybody. Okay, well, now we're going to look at something called the Great Commandment. This is one of those real shining moments in Scripture that a lot of people know about. Uh, it's from uh, the fourth verse here, is from, the fourth section is from verse 28 to 34, the Great Commission. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. So he wasn't part of this group, but he was a teacher of the law, and he heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him. So see, he is motivated. He thinks, wow, that's a really good answer. So he's asking a question from a real heart. He's not trying to trick Jesus. He's a seeker of knowledge. He wants to know. He's not just saying, well, it doesn't matter. He's not just saying, well, everybody's got a different answer. He says, that's a good answer. I want to know. And so he comes to Jesus, and he asked him, Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. It is called the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Isn't this interesting? Jesus is God incarnate, right? So God, who made a trillion, universe, he made a trillion galaxies, each galaxy with approximately a trillion stars, God who made all of this comes this little speck of dust in this cosmos. He comes down. He sets aside his glory. He's born in a manger. When God comes down and people say, what's the most important thing? God says, boy, I want you to love me with everything you got because that's why I love you. Love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. I fall short of that. But you know what? I know his love for me, and I want to love him more. Don't we want to love him more? God says, love me more. And we want to respond to that with love for God. Sometimes we have so many rules that we look, lose track of the fact that we're actually supposed to love God and care about other people. If your religion is so many, has so many rules that you forgot to actually be nice to people, it's wrong. We're supposed to love God. And love other people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying God is one and there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself is much more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Isn't that beautiful? He said, you're close. You're close. God says, oh, you're close. And from then on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. When we love other people the way God loves us, that means loving people who irritate us. That means loving people who have hurt us, loving people who have betrayed us, loving people when they've done us wrong. Luke chapter 6 tells us, I'm going to skip through the chapter there, I tell you,
Jesus is speaking. I tell you who hear me, if you have ears to hear, are, are you listening to Jesus? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Did you hear that? Love your enemies. Bless those who have said bad things about you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Skip down to 31. Do to others as you would have them do for you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Anybody can love people who treat them nicely. Jesus said, I want you to learn to love people when they're not treating you well. And even if you do good to those who do good to you, how, what credit is that to you? <coughs> even sinners do that. Skip down to 35. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High because we're going to be acting like God. Because he is kind to the ungrateful. Thank goodness, right? God is kind to the ungrateful. Does anybody think that's a good thing? He is kind to the wicked. Okay, well, I qualify again. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. And again, if we do this, we're going to have a, a taste of heaven in our families, aren't we? We're going to have friendships that last for eternity. Our church is going to be like just a little glimpse of heaven if we can learn to practice these things. So Christians have a hard job. Our king has commanded us, our king has commanded us, you love people the way I love you. And you know you're not that great a prize. <laughs> Actually, he thinks we are. He said, I'd die for you. And then he wants us to love that way. We have a hard time even loving the people who love us most. Everybody says, can't we just all get along? Can't we have countries love each other? My question is, how are you doing at loving your wife? How are you doing at loving your mom and dad? If, if we can't even love the people next to us, why do we talk about this pie-in-the-sky love about, let's just love those people who live across the sea who I never get to meet and never bother me? Start loving the people nearby, and God will give us. If we love God more, I'll tell you what, you can never love God too much. If you love God more, he will give you more love for your wife. He will give you more love for your husband and your children. Don't be worried that if you love God too much, you don't have any spare love. God is love. Does that make sense to everybody? Amen, right? We are made to be in relationship with God. And this section here comes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. The original Hebrew, this first part here reads, Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is one. Yahweh, in English we often say Jehovah, right? That's the same as Yahweh. Uh, Elohim is God's, it, 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 it's God, but it's, it's God, but it's in the plural, which is interesting. So I don't know how much to read into that, but Yahweh is our Elohim, plural. Yahweh is one. It's a very interesting way of saying things. The same as when God created the earth and he said, uh, let us make man in our image. He's talking about himself, but he's talking about himself in plural. Very interesting. Okay, uh, fifth section from verse 12, chapter 12. Jesus again teaches about his true nature from verse 35. Uh, who is the Messiah? Whose son is the Messiah? While Jesus was teaching the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, speaking in the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet. Uh, David himself calls him Lord. How then is he his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Jesus again teaching who he is. He is the son of David. He's the Messiah. Sixth part, uh, Mark 12, 38 through 40. Let's see, right there. Uh, as he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and, show, and, and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be mo uh, punished most severely. Again, Jesus doesn't go easy on religious people, does he? 
When God comes to earth, he saves the strongest words for people that are outwardly religious, putting on some religious show. How often is religion today just a show? Uh, either we're putting on a show to ourselves so we can convince ourselves we're better than we are. Well, I, I go to church, so I guess I'm not that bad. We're, we're just trying to fool ourselves. We're using God, we're using Jesus, we're using the Bible to fool ourselves. How does that make any sense? Uh, we're just trying to deceive ourselves, uh, think we're better than we are, make ourselves feel better than other people. How often is religion used so I can sit up on some hill and look down at other people? I should be on my knees saying, God, forgive, and instead I'm sitting on, sitting on some high horse or something looking down at other people. How dare we use religion to look down on other people? And how ridiculous. When you come to God on your knees, how do we turn it around into a way to be smug and superior and, and to look down at people who are struggling maybe with different things than we are? Don't use religion for a show. And other times we use religion to show off to other people. Well, look at me. See me? Maybe to your ex. I'm going to church. What about you? Uh, look at how holy I am. Look at how religious I am. Well, I... I'm a deeply spiritual person. You hear that? I don't go to church, but I'm a deeply spiritual person. Just using religious impulse to make ourselves look a certain way. We're playing games. We're playing marbles with diamonds. If there is no God, then you guys can stay here and play religion, and I'm going to go home and watch TV. Because if there's no God, I don't need to be here. I don't need to play religious games. I don't even like religion. If there's no God, there's no just play whatever games we want with it. No reason at all to do this rather than shampoo your hair or your rug or whatever, your car. But if there is a God, if there is a God that loves us and wants us to be a part of his family and says, I, I gave my life for you. This is important to me. I want to forgive you. If there is a God, how do you think it makes him feel when we take our faith that should be all about him, and we use it as a way to aggrandize ourselves. I'm going to use religion to make myself look like a big deal. Jesus said the Pharisees will receive greater condemnation. Did you hear that? Listen, I hear people say all the time, all sin is the same. All sin is equal. Right? You hear people say that all the time. All sin is the same. One sin is not worse than another. You know what? That's true in a sense. That any sin, no matter how trivial we think it is, puts distance between ourselves and God. You can think it's a little sin and somebody else has a big sin. Both of them separate us from God. So that's true. However, sins are not all equal in terms of the damage that they do to us and to our families and to our churches and to our homes. Some sins are hard to repent of. Pride is a very dangerous sin because when I have pride, I don't want to say I'm wrong about anything. How can you confess your sins, God forgive me, if you're not willing to forgive you, believe you have any? Well, I'm okay. I guess, I guess I've messed up in some ways, but I'm not as bad as other people. Well, then we're never going to get on our knees, are we? Pride is a killer. Sexual sin is often incorporated into our identity. Well, this is just who I am, so I can't say sorry for it. I was, I was just born this way, so I can't, I can't apologize for it. Well, I'm a man, so that's just my attitude, so I'm not going to apologize for it. I, I'm a, uh, this is my body and I can do whatever I want with it. Look at it. Now where is, where is repentance? And without repentance, where is grace? And without getting saved and the blood of Jesus Christ poured on us, how can we ever get to heaven? What a horrible lie that I can stand before you and say, you can't tell me. Suddenly we can't repent. So sad. One sin is not worse than another. And don't point your finger and say, that person's so much worse than me. All sin separates us from God. But honestly, some sin is hard to repent of. Some sin is so hard to repent of. And, and things like pride is a killer. We, we feel like we have to deny our own selves instead and to accept God. And we use religion as a way to elevate ourselves over people. That's serious. And Jesus says they will receive greater condemnation. Yeah, all sin is the same and that it separates us from God, there are some sins that are worse as far as making it more difficult to come clean and get right with God. Using religion to build yourself up, push other people down, God don't like it. Lastly, Mark chapter 12, 41 through 44. 
Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put. So they're at the temple there, and they're watching people put their offerings in. And uh, watch the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, and you know they'd even blow trumpets, and then they'd pour their money in slowly so you could hear all the coins dropping in, make it a big deal, look at how much we gave. And Jesus would sit there, and of course, there's probably planets made out of diamonds. So God is not impressed when we pour our gold coins into an offering plate. Uh, let, let them listen to him cling in the offering plate. Uh, God owns everything in the universe. He's not impressed with us trying to show off with our, with our funds. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins with only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples around, listen to this. This is God in flesh. Listen to it. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more into the treasury than all the others. God said, oh, I love this old gal. She's putting in. They gave out of their wealth. <coughs> She gave out of her poverty. She put in everything, all that she had to live on. And God saw. And God wanted to make sure we all know about this girl. So for 2,000 years, people have been reading the story of her sacrifice and what she did. God says, I'm not impressed with all the rich uh, folks putting in out of their abundance and making a show out of it and trying to get people's attention. She just humbly came up and put in what she had. It was, it was all she had, and God says, I love her heart. There's something else that's very interesting here, because she wasn't trying to be a big deal. Look at me. I'm poor, but I'm giving all I have. She was just wanting to give to God. Uh, something very interesting here. Jesus praises her. I would have been tempted to say, don't give to that temple. They hate Jesus. Don't give to them. They're, they're just putting on a show. Don't give to them. They're mean. They're ornery. She didn't give much, but she gave what she had. She didn't have to. Who did she give it to? Did she give it to a wonderful temple, a wonderful church, with full of loving pastors and, and, and rabbis and, and, uh, who would use the money well, well? Or did she give it to a corrupt temple that was full of false teachers who loved to show off? She gave it to, did she give it to a corrupt temple that wanted to kill Jesus? The answer is neither. She gave it to God. And God was there and he said, I accept your offering. And God had already said, I'm bringing the rest of this place down around their ears. Another amazing, uh, another amazing chapter we've seen here, Jesus is unlike anybody else in history. There's never been, I challenge you, there's never been a person like Jesus, never been a philosopher, never been a teacher, never been a political leader like Jesus. If you're a Christian, rejoice. This is your king, and he says some really good stuff. Uh, he loves you. He died for you. He prophesied in this, in this chapter 12 that I'm going to die for your sins. If you are not a Christian yet, what are you waiting for? Might as well get it done. I think in our hearts we know that this is true. We know that God is good, and we know that we should get our lives right with him. So I want to just encourage everybody, no matter where we're at in that spectrum, and whether you're a Christian or not, we're still on a spectrum. Am I, am I in a period of time where I've kind of been ignoring God for the last couple of months or years? Or, or am I a place right now where I'm getting closer all the time? Where, regardless of where we are, that's not what's important. From right now, I want to say, God, I hear your voice and I want to come to you. Lord, I want to get close to you. I want to be so close to my rabbi that your dust covers me. And what a compliment that would be if people look at us and say, he's dusty because he's close to Jesus. <laughs> Let's all be so close to Jesus that we start to look and act like Jesus, that we have the things that he cares about, love the things that he loves, and we want to raise kids in a way that Jesus Christ would be pleased with us, and we need all the grace we can for that, and we need each other too. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, thank you for allowing us to be here today. Father, today we want to say we want to come close to you. We don't want to fight with you anymore. We don't want to make excuses. Father, we love you, and we want to be more like you. Help us, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares, and it's he's put it on our hearts to try and 
uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just, uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step, leave your comfort zone at home, uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area. And I'm sure you're going to go there, you're going to be loved, you're going to be blessed, you're going to be encouraged, people are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home, but we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to, to, to know God better and to allow Him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let His grace rest upon our lives. So uh, again, I just want to encourage you, thank you for watching, but if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.